Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. Should we be concerned about this? Well, it depends who you listen to, Dave. If you listen to people who want to make you money and have an objective view of the world, then yes, you should. If you want to listen to the carnival barkers on Wall Street, then you shouldn't. So let's just look at some facts. So right now, as of this recording, the yield curve, the spread between the 10-year note and two-year note is 19 basis points. That is by far the lowest it's been outside of the Great Recession. And I heard a conversation today on CNBC that the yield curve is inverting only because, or at least I won't say only, primarily because interest rates in Europe are very low. And it is true. Interest rates in Europe, particularly the German Bund, the 10-year Bund is about 30 to 40 basis points. But here's the thing, Dave. That's not new. OK, the yield curve is inverting as it always does, because the Fed is raising short term interest rates and that is squeezing out liquidity from the system. It is draining money. It's destroying money. And also the Fed is not only raising rates, but for, for the first time in history it is also draining its balance sheet, 40 billion dollars worth a month, going to 50 billion in October. So $600 billion a year. So the Fed is destroying money rapidly. That's deflation, and that's bringing down the long end of the yield curve. And I want to say a couple of things about the yield curve. It bothers the heck out of me, so I'm glad I'm, I get to pontificate on shows like yours where you could just get a little bit below the superficiality of things and of people who don't know what they're talking about. And let me explain and see if you agree with me or not. The yield on the 10-year note on the German boom – is not new. That yield, that very low yield, has been in place for years. And yet, the long end of the U.S. bond market is falling. So we were above 3% a few months ago, and now we're at 2.8, a little bit above 2.8%, 2.82 to be percent. So you cannot say, it's not logical to say, that yields are low in Germany and thus forcing the yield on the 10 year to be low because the yield hasn't changed for years on the German boom. It has not gone down. In fact, it actually has climbed in recent years. And here's it. So, so let me just wrap that up. Our, again, our long term rates are falling. So it's set the long term. The long end of the bond market is clearly worried about slow growth and deflation. But beyond that, Dave, if the yield curve were to invert for other reasons, mechanical reasons, as the carnival barkers claim, I am not sure that makes a damn bit of difference. And the reason why I say that is because why are we so concerned about the yield curve inverting? Oh, yes, because every time it inverts, almost every time. 90% of the time since the Great Recession has ended, it, it has thrown the economy into a recession. But why? Why is it so important? The reason is, as I like to explain, when banks' assets are yielding less than their liabilities, they stop making loans. When their balance sheet gets upside down, they stop creating money. So there's no new money for Collateralized loan obligations, mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities. They stop making mortgages. And when that happens, the fuel, the credit channel dries up, and that means asset prices plunge. This is what happens. History is replete with these examples. So, so in my view, 
the yield curve is inverting for the same reasons that it has always inverted. You know, the, the Greenspan excused, excused it in 2000. Bernanke excused it in, in 2006. The yield curve is inverting for the same reasons. Low inflation, that's what's coming, reduced inflation, and a recession, and it's not going to be different this time. It's going to yield the same baneful results, a recession. And if we want, if I, if I can, uh, you know, just wrap this up, I'll follow up by saying a recession is so important because the market drops by 50% or more during recessions. And this time is going to be the worst. Is this why the Fed is out there saying that the yield curve is not really a good predictor of a recession and they, they're looking to find an alternative to the yield curve? Well, of course, they want to deflect attention, but not all. And there are several members of the Fed. I, mean, I, I listened to uh, James Buller today from Jackson Hole saying that, um, hey, listen, he is not going to deliberately invert the yield curve. Well, they're going to move, the Fed's going to move in September. That's almost guaranteed. And I think they go in December for the last time in this cycle. And that will surely invert the yield curve. Yield curve. Now, Bullard is not a voting member, but I listen to other members of the Fed too, and who are voting members who say they're very much cognizant of the fact that they do not want to invert the yield curve. But the people in charge, like Powell and Loretta Mester, Kaplan, they're going to go two more times. And that assuredly, in my mind, I mean, barring some kind of uh, crazy blow up in the long end of the bond market, but given the, the, the fact that I believe inflation is rolling over on a year over year basis, the comparisons are get very, very hard for inflation in the next few quarters, that we're going to have an inverted yield curve. And the same thing is going to happen again. Again, credit channel gets shut off and home prices collapse, um, asset-backed securities collapse, and the stock market begins to roll over hard. And I want to just say that I want to make sure I don't forget this, Dave. I also hear from the cheerleaders on Wall Street that the market is not expensive. I mean, what puke comes out of their mouths? Because on a forward basis, the market is trading at 17 times earnings. But if you look at other metrics, you have to understand earnings per share has been severely warped and distorted by debt funded buybacks. So if you look, even if you look at that ratio or the uh, PE ratio, it's still an expensive stock market. But if you just dig a little bit deeper, again, Tell me if you think I'm wrong. Okay. If you look at if you look at the price to sales ratio, which is not easily distorted by corporate buybacks, it's not just high. It's at a all time record high. It's higher than it was in the year 2000. If you look at the total market cap of equities, so price the price of equities times the shares outstanding as a percentage of the underlying economy. And that is at also a record high. So we have a, a, a record bubble in stock prices, in equity prices. We have a near record bubble in home prices. But we have the most pernicious bubble in the bond market ever. Never before have we had corporate debt at these levels. And even as a percentage of GDP, corporate debt is at a record high. And the quality of that debt is at a record low. So we have asset bubbles everywhere. I want to add this to you. I want to say this, that because the central banks of the world printed $14 trillion between 2008 and today, their balance sheets are up four to, their balance sheets have increased by $14 trillion to $22 trillion. They printed at the high, at the peak of QE, they were printing $180 billion worth of confetti each and every month. That is almost at zero now. But they did it to take interest rates to zero. And interest rates, surprisingly, are remaining close to zero, even though QE is almost over on a net basis globally. But the worst 
pernicious thing that they've done, besides reinflating the asset bubbles that I just mentioned in equities and, and real estate and, and fixed income, the debt of the world is up $70 trillion. The debt of the world has increased by over 40% since 2009. So we have fixed nothing. All we have done is engendered the worst, most destabilizing market and economy that the world has ever seen. Now, I'm going to tell you that it doesn't pay to always be bearish. I run money here. I manage money. I am not net short the portfolio, although there are several, there are many reasons why this fall, I probably will be net short the portfolio. We can get into that a little later. But it is my view that you have to map and model and determine where the economy is on that spectrum between inflation and deflation. We are headed closer and closer to a destabilizing, pernicious episode of uh, deflation and recession slash depression. That's what I'm, mo I'm modeling and mapping, and that's what I want to profit from. So you're saying that we're going to see two more interest rate rate hikes by December. Well, the one in September is is ninety something percent priced in okay. by the Fed funds future market. That's that's one. The second one comes in December. I think there's like a seventy percent chance of that happening. Uh, and then I think they're done. I think it's over for the Fed. That's it. You, when you I say think the over, do, I think I there mean, are no, no more interest rate hikes. Why? Why do you think that? Because I think the yield curve will be inverted by then. And I don't think the Fed is going to go and even invert their yield curve on a greater percentage than it would be at the end of the year. So the Fed funds, if they go twice, the Fed funds rate will be two and a half percent. I think the two year note is at 260, 270, and the long, long bonds are closer to two and a half where the Fed funds rate is. So, I, I mean, I don't I, I, I highly doubt that they would go again. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't I, I mean. I'll make that judgment call at that time. But it seems to me very unlikely that the Fed would look to more severely invert the yield curve after it's already inverted. I get this from listening to the members of the Fed. So would that trigger the recession at that point? Because if you know, you're raising the interest rates, you mentioned real estate, you, you mentioned you know, the debt. I mean, at that point, is that the trigger? Well, I think it, I think it collapses the stock market first. I think it then collapses the bubble and junk bond in the junk bond space. Um, high yield blows up, uh, leveraged loans blow up, and then you see what you always see: the stock market plummets, um, these asset-backed securities plummet, and then the unemployment rate starts to soar. Layoffs ensue. We have a, 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 a the the uh, deleveraging of corporate balance sheets ensues, and then you have a you have a vicious recession. I just want to tell you why I think it's going to be so so vicious is because um, the central bank at that point will only have 250 basis points of easing. And, and if you look around the world, the ECB won't have anything that they can do as far as lowering debt service costs, and neither will the Bank of Japan. So I mean, all they can do is go ramp up QE to unprecedented levels. I don't think that turns around the stock market. You know, usually, historically speaking, the Fed has to drop interest rates by 500 basis points or more to get borrowing costs down to a level that encourages people to borrow. But I mean, look, household debt is at a record high. The 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 national debt is over 100 105 percent of GDP. Um, corporations are already over leveraged. So who, which balance sheet? The Fed is balance sheet is four and a half trillion. The rest of the central banks are in, are engaged in QE. So I, who is the marginal um, buyer to step in and start to re-leverage? We're all, all the balance sheets are concurrently over leveraged. So there's no easy escape. There's nothing they can, nothing the, the government or central banks can readily do in dramatic and trenchant fashion to get the economy kickstarted again. And I, I, let me just say this to you, Dave. You okay. know, treasuries are, if you look at treasury debt, uh, the deficits are already at a trillion dollars. And during a recession, if I'm correct, uh, that's going to be uh, accretive to the uh, debt by over a trillion dollars, just like it was in 2008. We ran $1.4 trillion annual deficits. 
because these automatic economic stabilizers kick in like unemployment insurance. So, um, so if you're, if you're already running a deficit of a trillion dollars in the good times and you add on to that another trillion or so, um, you know, deficits are going to be two trillion plus you, are you then going to be able to encourage the government to start another huge stimulus package? I mean, it's going to be very hard to, for the bond market to swallow. Even if the Fed stops their QT, I, I would imagine they would stop draining their balance sheet for sure. But they will, they will, until they agree to do that, they're still draining $600 billion a year. So, you know, it's not going to be a very easy or very clean situation. Is this why Trump is out there criticizing the Fed, where he's saying, oh, I thought Powell was going to be like a, an easy money type of Fed chair, not a, a, an interest rate? Uh, type of Fed chair? Well, well, you know, candidate Trump was critical of the Fed as well. He was consistent at, in that front. He, he's a consistent critic of the Fed. But when he was candidate Trump, what he wanted was more rate hikes and faster rate hikes because he, he acknowledged the huge bubble that we have out there in, in the bond market and in the stock market. But now that he's President Trump, he's criticizing the Fed for completely the opposite reasons. He wants a weaker dollar and he wants low interest rates. But the thing is that, you know, we now have a year over year CPI rate of over 2.9 percent headline. So, I, I mean, you know, it's completely inconsistent of Mr. Trump to put pressure on the Fed to not raise interest rates when we have a year over year inflation at almost 3 percent. They should be the Fed should be doing their job and trying to normalize interest rates. The only problem is since they ha- they kept them at zero for a dec- for a decade. <laughs> I mean they they engineered they engineered these these massive bubbles and a huge increase in in uh, debt. The leverage ratio is at a record high. So I mean they really they really need to uh raise interest rates, but when they do, they'll realize the folly of keeping them there at zero for a decade. You mentioned something about deflation and inflation as, as we move into uh, this period where they're raising the rates and, you know, it kicks off into a recession. Uh, is deflation going to continue or is it going to switch into inflation? Well, we had, we've had the big spike in inflation. That's behind us. That's in arrears. Um, the Fed, like I said, is choking off money supply growth very, very quickly. Um, we, we're going into a deflationary recession slash depression, I believe, in, in two, early 2019. And then what they do, you know, let's just let's just look at pension plans. So you look at the public pension plans are massively underfunded. There are some estimates are four trillion dollars worth of underfunded pension plans that like seven. They're like 70 percent funded. Well, on the next recession, the, the assets that these pension plans hold, which bonds and in, and, and, and in greater fashion than ever, greater percentage than ever, equities. So when, when the pension plan gets wiped out again for the third time since the year 2000, um, the Fed is going to have to do something. I mean, they can't, if, if they did the right thing, they just let the whole financial system reset. But I don't think they're going to do that. I think Donald Trump, if he's, if he's still around, <laughs> if he's still president, is going to have to get on, you know, get on the bully pulpit and say, we must engage in – Drastic measures, even more than Bernanke did, to get inflation going again, and and that I fear includes, like I always been predicting, in response of the next recession slash depression, there's going to be helicopter money, there's going to be universal basic income, and there's going to be negative interest rate policies, negative interest rate policies, which means they're going to have to banish physical cash. Those are the three things that I see happening, at least. Just to try to get the just to try to get the money supply booming to reinflate these assets that are held on the public pension, you know, the Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, private pensions, public pensions, they're all going to be massively underwater. And unless you um, unless you think the Fed's going to sit back and watch, you know, penury uh, diffuse and pervade across the globe, and uh, I, I mean, I don't think they're going to actually be able to sit back and do that. So a lot of people, I mean, if this does happen the way you're saying it's going to happen uh, in the pension market, because I think they're based off like seven, eight percent, which we know the interest rates aren't there. So they're putting everything into the stock market. And if the stock market comes down, I mean, people are going to lose a lot unless the Fed does something. I mean, they're just going to lose all their money. 
Well, it's like like I said. So so in the next bond, in the next crisis, you're going to have most likely it'll be a 1970 style crisis. In that, I think um, in the 70s, um, bond prices fell because of inflation, and equity prices fell because the stock because the uh, economy wasn't doing well. Well, we had stagflation. Well, I think I think the same kind of scenario is going to develop. Where you have bonds, bonds are already in a in a in a, uh, a hyper bubble. I can't see them g- gaining value much at all. I think they fall in price. The yield goes up, um, and I and I am very confident that the equity bubble is going to be devastating when that pops. So um, pension plans are going to be wiped out. And like I just went through, I I just can't see the government and the central bank sit back and watch. Uh, uh, you know, shelves of the stores go empty and and people starving. They're, they just can't they, they, they just can't watch that happen. So they'll do what they always do, which is, you know, they'll say, well, hey, we 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 were very successful bringing the economy out of the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009, 2007, December 2007 to 2009. The only problem we did was getting out of QE too early. <laughs> so my my guess is they'll go back to it in in new and uh never before uh uh levels but if they do the universal basic income and and they flood the market with cash doesn't that just add to the debt add to the problem i mean is it really going to fix anything well no I mean, you'll you'll you're going to be grinding towards Venezuela. I mean, if you think, if you think Venezuela is a good place to live, you know, um, take a look at what's going on over there. You know, it's going to be Turkey, Venezuela, South Africa. These are all, you know, this is where we're headed. The modern day ex- examples of a dystopia. Uh, but printing money doesn't solve anything, um, especially when I talk about the, the UBI and the, and the ZERP. Um, helicopter money. They, these are things that are devastating to the middle class. Um, but this is, these are acts of desperation, which I think the, the government will do until the public demands once again that their money is backed by gold uh, or silver, uh, precious metals. And, and why do I, you know, why is that such a big deal? You ask. Well, because you know, if if you look at the the monetary base, should always be tethered to the mine supply, the increase in the mine supply of gold. And so if, 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 if you can tether the monetary base to a one or 2% per annum increase, just like the mine supply for gold is, then the monetary base grows commensurate with GDP, which is population growth plus productivity growth. And then you'll never have any of these bubbles. But I, I think when the, when the central banks come in, in never before unprecedented levels of printing in the wake of the next recession, I believe there's going to be a complete lack of faith in fiat currencies and the middle class will have to um, wake up and demand that, um, that we live in reality instead of, instead of the fantasy created by central bankers. Now, you mentioned where people lose faith in the fiat system. I mean, Russia has been out there saying that countries should use their national currencies to trade. I mean, think of, I'm thinking about the, the global, the, the world. If they lose faith in the dollar, I mean, that's going to be just completely devastating if they see what's happening here. Well, they're not just going to lose faith, faith in the dollar. They're going to lose faith in the yen and the euro and the pound, too. I mean, and the, and the, and the yuan. It's going to be a globally synchronized um, eschewment uh, of fiat currencies. So I think the big winner, the big winner, the unbelievable big winner out of the, in the next recession is going to be gold. So, and you think this is going to happen uh, later this year? This this is going to kick off? Gold. I think, well, I, well, well, Dave, I think it's already started. I mean, if you look at what's going on in emerging markets, uh, if you look what's going on in Turkey and Venezuela and around the world, uh, China is then in a bear market. So, um, I think it's already started to unravel. Um, I think our, uh, in yield, yield, like just to go through it real quickly again, our yield curve inverts later this year. I think our stock market begins to roll over with the economy next year. The year over year comparisons on earnings growth are devastating uh, next year. Um, I think the market rolls over. And um, I think at that point, 
in, in, wake of, in the wake of that next crisis, that's when you'll see gold absolutely rip higher along with the rest of the precious metal sector. So in your opinion, what should people do at this time to prepare for what's coming? Well, I manage, like I said, I manage money for a living. So, you know, what I'm doing is preparing my clients. I'm preserving their principal. I'm trying to safely make money in those sectors. I have five sectors between inflation and deflation and growth. So we're in sector two right now, which is you want some uh, utilities and some um, – uh, consumer staples, um, but in, in sector one, which is where we're headed, which where I believe we're headed in Q4 and in Q1 2019, you want to have a, a, a lot of more, a lot more shorts. So you want to be short high yield. You want to be short emerging markets. You want to be long the maybe perhaps long the U.S. dollar for. We were long the dollar for the last three months. Did very well. Close out of that position. We were short emerging markets. In the model portfolio, did well in that position. Um, but you want to have maybe S and P 500 shorts, so you want to gravitate towards the sector one, which has a lot more shorts in it, because that's that's where 2000 and 2008 those kind of markets come to the fore, and you want to be exposed to a deflationary recession slash depression at that time. That's what I'm doing for my for my clients. Uh, I also have about five, you know, you should have about 5% gold right now. Uh, we just heard today from uh, Mr. Trump that he thinks it's a good idea if uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin goes and sells dollars and buys Italian bonds. So, you know, you have a president who's on record saying he loves debt and he loves low interest rates and he hates a strong dollar. So you should always have some gold, even though it has not worked out at all. But you want to be slowly adding to that position on uh, pullbacks as we head into Q4 of this year. Michael, thank you very much for being on the X22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see all your work? So, you know, go to my website. It's mpento at pentaport.com. You can go and click on the midweek reality check for free trial subscription. It's only $49.99 a year. Um, And you can email me directly at mpento at pentaport.com. Uh, or you can call the office and speak to someone, 732-772-9500. We won't bite. It's a nice conversation you'll have and learn how you can prepare to protect and profit from the third massive debacle in the equity market since the year 2000. It's coming quickly, in my opinion. Michael, once again, thank you very much for being on the spotlight. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dave.